We're going to be in Matthew chapter 9. So if you want to turn there, we're just beginning of the chapter, Matthew chapter 9. The title of the sermon this morning would be, Where's Your Faith? And uh, hopefully that'll make sense uh, why I'm asking that question. Uh, as soon as you get to Matthew 9, everybody arrives there, I'll uh, ask you to join me in prayer. Okay, looks like I got most everybody. Would you mind joining me? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this uh, gathering, this uh, group of folks, uh, young and old, and um, family and friends and visitors. The Lord, I uh, just pray that you would meet with us now as you, you are so faithful. You just love your people and long to minister to us. And so we, we trust in that, Lord. And we ask that uh, as the psalmist prayed, that you would open our eyes to show us wondrous things from your word. And Lord, we look to you now as we open the book, as we look at the, the passages, we pray your Holy Spirit might um, just minister s- uh, sweetly and powerfully to us, uh, show us the insight and show us the application to our lives. Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so um, I'm going to start with a question. I'd like to start that just to make sure you guys don't, don't go passive all the way. You know, you've got to think a little bit to start with. So. Uh, the question, question is, what's faith? What is faith? And, and you don't have to answer out loud because I know most people are going to go, he, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Yeah, okay, that's, that's, that's not a bad place to go, right? Okay, so let's just put it up there. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So uh, because we, you know, sometimes wrestle with, well, what is that actually meaning? You know, well, part of it's the, obvious idea that you're putting your trust in promises that God's given to us that you go but I don't don't see the answer just yet but sometimes when we read that we kind of go well faith is invisible because it it can't be seen and I want to challenge you a little bit because uh, we're we're not when the Bible describes faith it's not as if he's describing faith or explaining that faith is something something like the emperor's new clothes you know you know the story Okay, right, an emperor's new clothes. He convinced him he was, had fancy new clothes on and he didn't have anything on. It was, you know, oh, only the intelligent people can see it. Yeah, right. So, um, but it, faith's not like that. It's not, it's not something that you, you c- it's there, but you can't see it. And I want to challenge you to think about that because we're going to see in the story here that Jesus actually uh, sees faith and it tells us it can be seen, not, not only by Jesus, but also by others. And so that's why I want to ask you the question, where is your faith? Where is it? Can it be seen? Because it, there's pra- a lot of practical applications. Hopefully if you've, you're thoughtful about it and you ask the Holy Spirit to give you some insight, there's, there's a lot of ways that you could apply this in your own life. One situation that is very common in our culture is we have people who say, I believe, but you look at their lives and you go, it's not any different than it was before. Uh, you're the same person. You just act the same way. You say the same things. You do the same things, and yet you say you believe. And you go, is it is it right to say, where's your faith? Where, where's the evidence of that? I don't see anything, right? And so um, we start in the story. Uh, we've been tracking through the Gospels, and Jesus has been over on the basically the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, and it tells us that now he's returning back to the western side to his, his own city, which gives us, a, it's Capernaum, the city of Capernaum, where he was living temporarily with Peter, um, Peter's house. And so they cro- get in the boat, they cross back over the sea, coming to Capernaum, and then behold, while he's there, it tells us Matthew's very short here, very, doesn't give us a lot of details. He says uh, they brought him a paralytic lying on a bed. Paralytic would be somebody who is uh, paralyzed from the legs down. Not a, not a quadriplegic, but a paraplegic. And uh, this guy can't walk. So uh, they, it doesn't tell us any details about what who's they and how many are they and who are they. It doesn't give us that stuff. But it tells us when Jesus saw their faith. Okay, so obviously he saw something that, that gave evidence of these guys having faith. And so the, the question is, uh, whose faith did Jesus see? There's some people and a paralytic 
and he says he saw their faith. Are we talking about the paralytic's faith? Because it actually, he might be included in this, but it's not exclusively him, because otherwise he'd say he saw his faith. So it includes some of the other guys, uh, maybe all the other guys, and you know, reasonably probably the paralytic too. But we don't get that detail just yet. Well, how did Jesus see their faith? That's the question. Is it like a supernatural revelation, the gift of the Holy Spirit to see faith? Um, is there any way that you can see faith? I, wanna, I want you to think just a little bit about that as we look in here. We get more details, which helps us kind of answer those questions. Whose faith? How did he see it? All that kind of stuff. Uh, Mark chapter 2. You realize that there's some events that are told in parallel accounts in the different Gospels. So Mark has the parallel account, so does Luke. In Mark, it tells us that Jesus came back to the city of Capernaum. It tells us specifically it's Capernaum. And after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Jesus had been ministering. He had gone across the, the lake, Sea of Galilee. And now he's returned, and there was a large crowds before. Now the word's gotten out. Jesus is back in town, and he's back at Peter's house. So people start to go there because they want to be around. They want to hear a teaching. They, you know, they're, they're drawn to him. And immediately, many gathered together, and so that there was no longer room for them to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. So you can imagine, you know, it's like cramming people into this house. They're, they weren't large homes to begin with, but... You know, people are crowding in, crowding in, and the doorway gets filled, and probably by the windows, you know, looking in the windows so that they could hear, and then there's just, just a large crowd gathering. You can't get anybody else inside. People are standing around outside, and this is the location, the setting that the, these individuals come to. Uh, it says, they came bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. So that, that helps us, right? It's four guys probably like a stretcher situation where everybody's got a corner and they're, they're carrying this paralytic. So four guys plus a stretcher and a paral paralyzed man, and they're approaching the house packed out with people. Now, you know, if it's packed out with people and nobody can get in, you, you couldn't even sneak in yourself, let alone with a stretcher and four guys. So the interesting thing is they, they could have quit. They could have gone... Sorry, dude, we tried. I mean, really, they could have just said, hey, there's no way we're going to get in there. Uh, you know, we'll have to, can you hang out for another couple of days? Maybe we'll catch him by himself sometime. You know, they, they could have come up with a lot of you know, reasonable things to say, yeah, it's just not going to work. We'll, we'll, we'll try again some other time. But they don't. They, they couldn't come near because of the crowd. And so what happens is they uncover the roof. Now, that, that doesn't really uncover. What, what does that mean? Well, if we understand... These structures are not unlike some stuff that we would see in the deserts, uh, southwest desert here, uh, old school. I mean, back, obviously, we're hundreds and, well, actually a couple thousand years back. But, you know, we, we see a lot of the adobe kind of buildings here where, uh, you know, you build a wall out of uh, dried mud, and then you would put some logs across the top, you know, small tree kind of things, and then you lay a cross patch over that, and then you put mud on top of that, and it dries, and it's a pretty good insulator, and you know it's a decent roof because they don't get a lot of rain there. So you go, hey, it works. They could do it with the materials they have. And then these structures commonly would have a set of stairs on the outside, so that people could access the roof, because in the climate, uh, you know, afternoons the house would get quite warm, especially if you were cooking in it. So you go up on the roof, you get a nice little breeze, you know, you, a little view of the area. And so it was kind of like a patio upstairs. And so they see this little set of stairs go up on the top and they start figuring out how do we get into the room where Jesus is? Easy, we just break the roof. And so they do, they start pounding on the roof probably to crack the, the dirt and then start pulling it off and pulling out the underlayment. And pretty soon they, they got a big old hole in the roof. Now, now just think about it. Think about how spoiled we are. Right? When we have church, uh, if somebody in the back starts to talk, people go, you know, I mean, what are you doing back there? I'm, you're distracting me. Can you imagine being at this place? I mean, 
boom, 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 dust falling down. And Jesus is in there teaching a Bible study, and he, he apparently keeps teaching. And they apparently keep listening. It, it's pretty funny to watch people, you know. Uh, I've never understood why it's so fascinating if somebody will get up during the service and go to the bathroom. Everybody watches them. <laughs> I mean, it's like I want to go up here, hey, pay attention to me. <laughs> you know, but it's like you watch the heads. And, and they're not doing anything except walking, but it's more interesting, I guess. <laughs> I guess I should be insulted. <laughs> but he says they, he, they uncovered the roof where he was, and so when they had broken through, they let down the bed. So not only did they make all this mess, create this opening, skylight opening in the roof, then they drop lower, not drop, <laughs> lower the guy in, and he's suspended in midair right in front of Jesus in, in on this cot, this, this, you know, it's like, wow, talk about distracting. And, and James is talking about, that's what Jesus saw. That's what he saw. He saw their faith being expressed in those actions. See, they, they believed, clearly they believed that Jesus would help this guy. If they could just get him to Jesus, Jesus would help this man. They didn't know how he would help. They assumed that he would see his greatest need would be to be healed. And they assumed Jesus had power and the willingness to do it. And so they, they lower this guy right in front of him to say, come on, Jesus, do something for us. That's what Jesus saw. He saw their faith, their faith expressed in these actions. This is what James talks about it. And, he's, and he talks about faith that can be seen because it's expressed in action. Uh, he says, what is the problem, my, br my brethren, if someone has faith but doesn't have works? Uh, the word works always translates for uh, us to say, oh, I'm trying to earn my way to salvation. I'm trying to earn salvation. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying it's action. He says, what, what, how, how does it help anybody if you say, I have faith, but it doesn't, there's no action. There's no expression of it. It doesn't do anything. And he says, can, can that faith save him? Now, we'll be really, I'll be straightforward. The Bible says you are saved by grace of, through faith, right? So it's, it's faith, it's faith. Not that actions don't save, but real faith, James says, will have actions, right? And, and he draws the, he says, look, if, if your brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, if they're, you know, uh, no clothes, uh, naked means no clothes at all, right? And, and destitute of daily food, that sounds like somebody that's starving. And you, you run across somebody like that, and one of you says to them, depart in peace. God bless you, you know. Be warm. Be filled. He, he's, it's like <laughs> the, the part that he didn't put in there is be warm, be filled, and be gone, right? It, it's, it's the way of dismissing somebody without actually helping them when they're in serious need here. And he says, but if you don't give them the things that are needed for the body, what's the profit? I mean, how does that help them? What's, what's the benefit of that? And then he goes on, he says, this, thus also, in other words, in the same way, if you draw that comparison, in the same way, faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, if it doesn't have some expression, it's dead. And I mean, would it, without doing a big theological thing, can we just reasonably agree that dead faith won't save you, right? I mean, does that make sense? And he's saying, but someone will say, well, you have faith, I have works. He's, he's not saying, that's not, it's not a contest, but show me your faith without works. You say you have faith? Okay. How are you going to show it? How is it going to be seen if it doesn't in any way take some form of action? He says, me, I'll show you my faith by my works. Whereas my faith lives. My faith takes action. My faith is real. It makes a difference. And you'll be able to see the faith. It's not a statement that we get saved by works. It's just a statement that real faith has some expression. And that's what Jesus saw. These guys were faithful friends. I don't know if you would think of them that way, but it's, it's easy for me to think of them as being friends because they care about this guy but they're faithful friends they're, they really want to help him they they know they believe that jesus needs this guy needs jesus that jesus can help him and do something for him and so 
That's why they're going to bring him to Jesus. They were determined to bring him to Jesus. Determined. These are, these are faithful friends. They didn't give up on this guy. They didn't uh, sit back and look at him and go, yeah, it'd be really, you know, probably be awesome if somebody could, somebody could get him to Jesus. They're going, no, we've got to help this guy. We've got to help our friend. They, they couldn't help him very much. Could they have done some things for them with their own strength? Sure, they, they, they could, you know, say, hey, you know, we'll figure out a way to make it easier for you to get around, maybe get you some, a cart or wheelchair or something. You know, something, they could have done some things like that, but their ability to help is pretty limited. They, they believe that Jesus could and would do more than they can. And that's why they insist on going him. But they, they really don't know how much Jesus was going to do for them. He, he, he does way more than they could have ever imagined. They, they thought, I mean, in their wildest dreams, they're thinking, wouldn't it be awesome if Jesus could heal this guy? I mean, well, he can, but would he? Wouldn't it be awesome if he would heal this paralytic? That's as far as they were willing to imagine, and Jesus did so much more than that. Jesus, when the paralytic was lowered into the room, says to the first thing he says to this, this guy, cheer up. <laughs> you know, I mean, he can say that because he knows what's coming next. If we were in the room, we would probably be going, oh, that's a little insensitive, Jesus. <laughs> you know, he's kind of paralyzed, and you're saying, hey, don't have such a bad attitude. <laughs> but he knows what's coming. He says, cheer up. Be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. I, I'm pretty sure without, without doing any great Bible exposition that his friends that are on the roof lowered him down. That's not what they had in their minds at all. And so they're lowering him down and think, oh, he, he just said, so, he said something to our friend. What did he say? He said, don't be so sad. Cheer up. That's good. That's good. What else did he say? Your sins are forgiven. What? I mean, that's not what we brought him for. Right? I mean, you wouldn't be thinking, oh, yeah, he really needs to have his sins forgiven. He, you, maybe theologically you go, I'm sure he does, but he, he's paralyzed. Lord, that's, that's what's really a, the need. But Jesus understood. He, he had a problem that was greater, greater than just being paralyzed, which let's not minimize the paralysis, but there's something that's far more, more important, far greater problem. As bad as it is to be paralyzed, it's infinitely worse to be lost in sin, to be bound in sin. And that's why Jesus addresses this need first and foremost. We, we minimize sin. We, we kind of soft sell it and, you know, uh, oops, I did it, oops. And we, we don't really get the, the weight and importance that, that God puts upon sin. And says so you, you, you desperately need a savior. There's no hope without a savior, someone who would pay for your sins. That's why Jesus came. He's the only way. And so uh, we look at sin and what it does in the world. We can get a better idea. I mean, bigger, open our eyes a little bit. Sin is the, really the root of all the evils that we see in our world. The way we treat people, the way we uh, exploit things, the crime, the human trafficking we just go down the list the disruption of homes the abandonment of children you just go sin 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 behind all these things the cause of all this evil forgiveness is more important than any kind of a bodily healing or blessing uh, the cool thing is that god is gracious enough to also heal and provide healing and, and do those kinds of things even though he says well it's really not as, as important but he knows that we, we value health, and so he, he cares and loves and, and heals. The most important th thing that Jesus came to do and to deal with was sin. That's the reason he came, to save us from our sins. That's the announcement at his birth. You will call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All right? And when a man's sins are forgiven, the great news for you and I is we become part of the family of God. We become sons and daughters of God. It's part of the forgiveness and salvation he provides for us. And we see in this little story how God responds to faith in Jesus Christ. He forgives people. He saves them. That's, that's the, the example we see right here in Jesus. In verse 3 it says, in one, At once some of the scribes said within themselves, they heard Jesus say, Your sins are forgiven. They have an immediate response to that. 
And they respond to saying, this man, this is blasphemy. Why? Because he's saying he can forgive sins, and they know, rightfully so, only God can forgive sins. No, no human being can forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. Mark chapter 2, that parallel passage, tells us what they were thinking. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins except God alone? See, they, they felt like you just said something that is not true. You cannot. That's misrepresenting God. That's, that's blasphemy. Uh, and Mark responds with this, this account that we're going to see is also in, in Matthew. Jesus says, look, I know what you guys are thinking. Why are you thinking like that? Which would be easier? To say your sins are forgiven or rise and walk? Okay, and that's exactly what uh, Matthew tells us. Why do you think evil in your hearts? See, he, Jesus knows what their attitude is, and it's like their attitude is this critical, and, and, and it's like, why are, why are you thinking like that? Why you got to get all dark and weird like that? You know, he, he says, which is easier? So here we go, let's take a poll. You guys paying attention? This is audience participation. Okay, so which is easier to say? How many of you think it would be easier to say your sins are forgiven? Notice the, the question is, which is easier to say? Not, not, not accomplish, because some people go, well, that's not, no, okay. Well, he didn't say that. He said, which is easier to say? How many people? Okay. You guys are so funny. <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want you to hold, I'm not going to embarrass you. Okay. How many people think it would be easier to say you're, you're a rise and walk? Okay. All right. That's, that's not a bad split. Okay, so if you say, your sins are forgiven. What happens after that? Huh? Somebody gets this. Well, no, no. If you have the power, right? Right. So, but if you don't, if you don't have the power, what happens after that? Nothing. Right. I mean, th there's there's no way to know if you've done it. Right. There's no way to test it, and so. Uh, what happens if you say, rise and walk? And what happens after that? Well, maybe he rises and walks, so, uh, <laughs> but what if he doesn't? I mean, obviously, what we're saying is that after that, people can see if anything happened. Right? So which one's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven because there's no way to evaluate it. There's no way to test it. Right? You can just say it. And everybody just goes, well, we can't, we can't know. That's pretty easy for you to say. Right, and so Jesus knows that that they're probably thinking, "Oh, pff, you just said that, and there ain't one no way to test it." So, yeah, you blasphemer, you, All right? And so, so Jesus responds to it and says, "So you know, just so you know, that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins." Then he said to the paralytic, "Arise, take up your bed, go to your house," and he rose and departed, which says very clearly. Yeah, he has the authority to forgive sins. And you're right. Only God has the authority to forgive sins. The Son of Man is a title out of the book of Daniel. And, and we see in this why these guys had a struggle. It's, it's not an unusual struggle that we see Jesus doing things that are divine, they're God, in action. But we also see them going, but, but you're just you're a man. And how do, how, how do we reconcile those things? That's the message of the gospel, the Emmanuel God in the flesh. And it, it presents real challenges to people even today. It's like, well, is he God or is he man? He's both. But, 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 but you know, we see him eating and doing human stuff. You go, yeah. And then we see him calming the seas and forgiving the sins, sins and raising the dead. God stuff. And you go, yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. He's God in the flesh. That's why he, when he dies on the cross, his life and his sacrifice means so much. He's able to pay the price for all of us. And so when the multitudes saw it, they went, wow, you know, marveled and they glorified God that he had given such power to men. They saw him as a man, but he displayed the power of God. C.H. Spurgeon, who's known for being pretty direct and pretty clear, he says, a man gives proof of his conversion. Right, I got saved, I, you know, I come to know the Lord. Okay, give proof of his conversion from sin, sin to God. Uh, who, who imitates this paralytic? 
In other words, if you get saved, you'll be like this paralytic. He got up and he went home. He's, he, he doesn't rise and stand upright. He who does not rise and stand upright but continues either groveling on the earth or falls back uh, as, as soon as he's got up, he, that person is not yet cured of his spiritual palsy. He's saying, you know, you, when you come into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and he gives you new birth, new life, it shows. And if it doesn't show, I guess you didn't get the cure. You, you, you haven't been healed or delivered from that sin. Um, Jesus, shift gears now. We're going to another event here. Verse 9, Jesus passed from there. So he apparently left the, uh, the town or he's on the process of leaving the town. He's walking out the main street most likely. And there he saw a man named Matthew. This is the same Matthew of the Bible or the book we're reading. Matthew sitting at a tax office. We know that he was a tax collector. And uh, Jesus says to him, follow me. So he gets up from his tax collecting station and begins to follow Jesus. Now think about being one of the disciples. You walk in, you know, these guys are fishermen. They, they shouldn't be like all impressed with their mission, but they're, they're pretty excited to be involved with Jesus, right? It's, it's probably a step up from being a fisherman. Not, nothing against fishermen. But, you know, it's, it's like certainly more higher esteem kind of a thing. You know, and they're walking with Jesus, and he, he's, he walks by a tax collector and says, hey, come on, join my team. You, know, you think the disciples kind of went, him? You don't, you want one of those guys? Jesus, what are you doing? Do you know who that is? The, we, we need to see this in, in, through some first century eyes, if we can do that kind of thing, to understand this display of an incredible, amazing grace. It's the same grace that's available to you and I. It's not unique just to Matthew, but, I mean, these tax collectors, they were considered to be notorious sinners. I mean, like, they have renown. They're, they're famous for being sinners. They, they were, if you became a tax collector, it was considered to be completely disgraceful. It was shameful to your family, embarrassing. The whole family was like, oh, Matthew became a tax collector. I mean, I can't believe that. It's so embarrassing. They were hated uh, almost universally. They were considered to be liars, cheats, extortioners who used power to extort money, taxes from people. They were considered to be traitors because they served the Roman government. And Jesus says, we want you on our team. I mean, don't, wouldn't you kind of go, no, Lord. Think about our reputations. Your reputation as a fisherman? Yeah, yeah, but that's the way we respond, right? Sometimes we were like that. When a Jew became a tax collector, he was excommunicated from the synagogue. You cannot come to church. If you're a tax collector, you, we know what you're all about, and you don't belong here. Uh, and he was disqualified from ever being a judge or a witness in, in court because we know you're a liar. I mean, that's, that's the kind of thing that they dealt with. Think about Matthew. Matthew had a primo gig going. No, seriously, this, this location, uh, because of the Sea of Galilee and because of the trade that went through that area, this was, a, this was a very lucrative spot. And most reasonably, most likely, he bought that position. And so here's a guy who... Uh, you know, work the angles, work the thing, bought this position, and he's, he's raking in the bucks because that's the way they use this tax collecting position. Uh, the disciples, think about this poor disciples, they had probably paid him taxes on more than a few occasions. Can you imagine him coming in after a hard day out on the lake, bringing in, here's the tax collector, going, okay, so what, how much you guys get? Okay, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just take, uh, let's see, you know, here's what you owe. And here's the disciples going, stinking Roman tax collector. You know, we worked so hard, and he just takes our, you know, no, you would never say anything like that, right? <laughs> right. No, you totally get it. It's like, yeah, I'd, I'd grum be grumbling, but not out loud because you could get arrested for that. But just in your heart, right? Imagine there was more than a couple awkward conversations after Matthew joins the team. Imagine the first meal they sit down to. Hey, Peter, can you pass the fish? Yeah, fish like whatever we covered, you know, passing it to Matthew. And, but 
that's only until they realized and they understood, they really get it, it really clicks with them. Jesus came to save sinners. Yeah, Matthew's a sinner. So am I. All right? Do you see any any connection between some of the things that we struggle with sometimes? We see people that we, we categorize as like, this is a notorious sinner. This is not a good guy. This is, he's, a, he's a gang member. He's this, he's whatever, and you know, drug dealer, whatever. And you go, we, we don't want any of those guys on our team. And Jesus goes, I do. I don't want, they won't continue to be evil, but, but he came to save, save sinners, right? And, and if we understand that, we go, well, yeah, that's why I'm here. That's why, why I'm in, on the team, and that's why I'm part of this, because he saved sinners. He saved a sinner like me. The, the amazing thing of the gospel is that no one's excluded. If they, if they will respond, they never get the door slammed in their face. You know, there's a whole bunch of places around the world that you and I would be totally excluded from. We will never, ever get in. We're just not important enough. We're not, we're not connected enough. We're not rich enough, whatever enough. And yet when it comes to the kingdom of God, the family of God, when it comes to heaven, God says, if anyone who comes to me, anyone who comes to me, I will in no way cast out. God would never tell a person who comes to him and go, we don't want any of your kind around here. There's nobody like that. Even though sometimes we think there's people that are beneath us, I guess. We we'd, wouldn't intellectually think they're beneath Jesus, but we kind of go, we, we don't really want those kind of people in our group. And Jesus is going, huh, that's funny because I died for the whole world. That's John 3.16. That's why we love this, this verse in John. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever, I mean, is that, could you make it a bigger open door than whoever? No, it, it's for whoever. Whoever would believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And, and that's what we see consistently through the 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 New Testament revealing the character of our Savior, our God. Matthew, I, I, I like this guy, Matthew. Don't get me wrong, I wouldn't have liked him if he was you know, still in his tax collecting business, but this guy had a very significant sacrifice to follow the Lord. He gets up from his tax collecting booth, walks away, he can never go back to that. They'll, they'll replace him in a heartbeat, and there'll be people paying for the privilege to have his position. Whereas the, the other disciples, at least the fishermen, oh, they could have gone back to fishing. Matter of fact, they sort of did during the time of Jesus' death and, and oh, during that resurrection time. They, they, they said, oh, let's, let's go back to the Galilee, let's go fishing. They go back to their boats, back to their nets, and they begin to fish. And Jesus kind of meets with them and goes, what are you guys doing? You know, but they, they had the opportunity to go back to their family businesses Matthew didn't. I, I think he was very much like Paul. I think I see in his actions, we don't have it recorded because he doesn't talk about himself so much, but um, I think he displayed the same faith that Paul, when in Philippians, Paul said, you know, I used to be a rabbi. I was a Jew, you know, of Jews, the Hebrew of Hebrews, um, trained, position of honor, position of esteem within Judaism. He walked away from it all. And he said, it's, what used to be gain to me, used to be important, it's, it's, it's nothing to me now. It's, it's like less than nothing. It's, it's rubbish. So that I might gain Christ and be found in him. And we see Matthew doing the same thing, walking away from uh, finances and, pres well, maybe not prestige, but finances uh, and, and you know, wealth and just going, you know, I'm going to follow Jesus and it costs me everything and that's okay because he lives his whole life serving the Lord and then dies as a martyr. And that's, that's a display of some real genuine commitment. This guy was a family disgrace. Think about his name. Matthew means the gift of God. Levi means that he was from the tribe of Levi, intended to be a Levite in the service of the temple. Can you imagine his parents? Tribe of Levi. We have a son. Awesome. We're going to train him, and, and he's going to grow up to serve the Lord. And we've got to name him Matthew is the gift of God. And he grows up and becomes a tax collector. The worst 
disappointment and heartbreak for a family, for a parent's going, oh, we just want him to grow up and be a godly man, and he's, he's a public and a tax collector. He's oh, the worst. And I don't know. I, I, don't think he, I don't know his parents, so I don't know what, but I'm assuming they would be normal parents. You go, I just want my son to be godly and be a good example and maybe be an influence somehow. As, you know, Levi, maybe he'd help people find the Lord. Jesus accomplishes this in a way that they could never have imagined. This tax collector, because he comes to know the Savior, he comes to know the Messiah, uh, he, he becomes an influence not just to Israel, but certainly to Israel, because Jesus came, shared the gospel, and he's, he, he recorded the gospel message, the, the life of Jesus, and s- circulated it among the Jewish people, but not just them. Gentiles read this too. And Gentiles through the the centuries, through the millennia, have had the opportunity to go to the Gospel of Matthew and read about Jesus and find the Savior. He's influenced people for centuries, for millennia, and really has influenced the world because of his involvement with Jesus Christ. And you go, you think his parents are proud of him? I I think they're blessed beyond measure. Maybe not proud because they don't take credit for it, or, or they just go, our son, our son was a disciple of the Messiah. Our son was an apostle. Our son penned one of the Gospels. Oh, yeah, I think there's a few, few tears of joy and excitement and amazement coming from those parents. Verse 10, Jesus, he, the, it's, now it happened, to, Jesus sat at the table in the house that, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. So Matthew's a brand new Christian, brand new follower of Messiah. And the first thing he does, uh, it it says many people, it it implies that this was not just a home, but really a banquet place, because it's like stuffed full of people. And he's inviting all of his former friends. Isn't it interesting? Because sometimes today, what we do is we, we abandon all our former friends to follow the Lord, which, yeah, you should follow the Lord, but what about your friends? Don't you care about them? He wants them to be introduced to Jesus. And so he puts on a big old feast, invites his friends who are tax collectors because that's all the friends he's got, and sinners, which is a general term, not just like they were really rotten people, just a general term for people who weren't religious. You think there's any sinners in our culture? People who are not religious? Right? And, and that's part of what Jesus is saying. I came to call sinners to repentance, not the, not the righteous. So often what we do is we go and find the righteous people. You know, uh, they're going to this church over here, and we invite them to church. And it's like, if they're going to another church, let them go to that church and actually encourage them to go to that church because there's a whole bunch of sinners out there. Now, I don't, don't take it the wrong way. I'm not saying, oh, yeah, the sinners, the horrible dirt. No, they're just not religious people. They don't have a relationship with God. They're not involved in a place where they're hearing God's word. And Jesus said, I, I, those are the guys we want to reach to. If they're righteous, awesome. But what about those guys? He came and shares with his, these individuals, invites them to meet Jesus. I can imagine the disciples going, we're going where? With who? We're going to go hang out with these guys? And you see Jesus is kind of modeling for them. Yeah. These are the guys that we come to reach. We don't come to join them in their sin. We come to reach to them with the love of God, with the salvation that's available to them. When the Pharisees saw it, they had a typical religious response. Oh, you shouldn't be eating with those kind of people. You know, they're they're defiled. They're they're sinners. Sometimes, sometimes guys, sometimes we're like that. Maybe not you. I hope not you. But sometimes church people can be that way. Somebody that looks this way, um, <coughs> small town. Oh, you know that guy? He cheats on his wife. Oh, you know that guy? He, he's a drug addict. Oh, you know that person? Oh, yeah, she's, she's loose. Oh, oh, we don't want those people in our church. No, we want them in heaven. All right? that, that's, that's what Jesus came to save sinners. And so uh, the, why do you eat with them? Because, you know, if you're going to share with them, you, you got to, be around them somehow. I'm not saying go hang out with them in the bar or things like that. Come on, we know that. Jesus didn't go sit down and say, hey, let's have a couple, shoot, 
kick back a couple brews, you know, and talk about the Lord. No, no, that's that's twisted, weird. But <laughs> reaching to people, uh, displaying the love of God, speaking the gospel message. That, that's what we see example modeled for us here. When Jesus heard their response, he says, don't you realize those who are well don't need a physician? If you're a doctor, you don't go and hang out with a bunch of well people, people who are sick. If you have the gospel message, you don't go hang around with just righteous people. I'll tell you honestly, it's a challenge. Okay, especially, I'm, Dave will tell you the same thing. Being in ministry, hey, 95% of the time we're talking to believers. And it's like, you know, it's like, I don't want to be somebody that doesn't know the Lord. I want to talk to somebody that doesn't know the Lord. Your neighborhood, your friends, people around you, he says, they're, they're sick. Not, not, not sick head, spiritually. And the gospel is the, the healing. It, it's the, 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 the deliverance that they need. And we need to understand God. That's what Jesus told these religious guys. You need to understand this. You, you, can, you, you think you know God, but you missed this. This is big stuff. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. God says, I, I want you to be merciful. I'm merciful. I want you to show mercy to people. Don't give them what they deserve. That's justice. No, just be merciful. Show them mercy. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, to call them to turn. And, and I remember, this is just comes to mind, I, I, when I first, when, when I, the Lord was reaching out to me, this one particular evening, he, he had gotten my attention in some ways that I, I didn't really even understand at the time, but I was just questioning things, and he put a guy in my life, the guy was a roommate across the hall from me in the dormitory I was living in, uh, two o'clock in the morning, he comes walking out of the dorm and looks me right in the eye and says, hey, do you need to talk? And at the time, I was like, I'm not religious, you know, and I know who you are, and I'm, you know, but, but uh, honestly, I was going, I got no answers, and yeah, I could, I could, I could, yeah. That's as good as I was at like, communicating. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he, so he, I remember him sitting down with me and sharing a whole bunch of stuff, and I don't remember much, but what I do remember was this word picture that he gave me. It says, God's loving Father has his arms out to you. You're going the wrong way. You gotta turn. You gotta turn around. You gotta turn around, repent, and come back to me. And I was like, that stuck with me. It wasn't the, I, you know, I wish I could say I got down on my knees and accepted the Lord at that time, but no, it took me. I'm slow, so it took me a while. But but that picture stuck with me. It's like that's exactly what he's saying. Jesus came to call sinners to repentance. And so, practical question. And it, I hope this works for, for all of you to think about it. Where, where, where is your faith? Now, I'm not saying you've got to answer to me, but you know, where, where is your faith? Is it, can it be seen? Do, do you have faith that God is merciful and that he's, he's gracious? Because that's, that's the reality of it. Is, and and it, your faith, as it's expressed, should ex- to show that to people. God's not judgment on harsh and critical and after you and trying to run you down. Uh, he, he calls sinners to repentance, so he's not approving of sin, but there's mercy and there's grace there. Uh, do, we, do we have faith that, that God reaches to sinners and that sinners who find forgiveness by repenting and coming to faith in Jesus Christ, coming to him in faith, they receive eternal life? Do we have faith that that's true? Because if we do, that's, that's the message that we, our faith should share with others. That this is a message for sinners. This is a message for people who are lost, not for the righteous. The righteous, honestly, don't feel like they have any need for that. And if, if, whether they're genuinely righteous or uh, self-righteous, but sinners, oh, they need a savior. Do you have faith that knows God cares about people? And, and that he believes, a faith that believes that Jesus can and will help them in ways that no one else can. That's why we want to bring them to him. Say, you need him. You need him. Bring people to Jesus. That's what faith does. That's what our faith should do. Your faith in action should be bringing people to him. Not to you. Church is okay. I mean, bring them to church. That's fine. Hopefully they'll hear about him here or whatever church you go to. But but more importantly, that you'd point them and say, this is not about joining a church. This is not about 
you know, being part of a membership. This is about you coming to know Jesus personally and, and bring them to him because he's, he's the miracle worker. He's the gracious one. He's the one that has the power to forgive and give them new life. And we just want to, hey, you need to know him. Let him do his amazing work. Amen? Okay, let's, let's pray together and we'll turn it over to the worship team.